Hello, my name is Juanita Thomas. I am a human trafficking survivor and I was in a public place that sits in 31 big cities across the United States that is doing human trafficking. So it all started in August 2021. I lost everything. God told me to quit my nine to five and I ran off on my business income by faith until it all clashed all at once and I had to move. So I lost my apartment. I lost my storage unit, with all my business supplies in it. I lost my car, couldn't um, afford to pay the bills anymore. So I lost all those things. And as I was losing those things, I was going through a little phase and I was like, what am I gonna do? So that's when I went to one of my friend's house one day and and her friend was sitting on the porch and she was saying how you can get a lot of help up north. And I was like, I have family up north, like I can get help up there, but nobody knew what was going on with my situation. So I took up what she said and ran with it. So I went online and I was searching a whole bunch of different shelters up north that I could go stay in. And some of them wasn't fitting my needs. I was like, I wanna be around more youth. So um, more people that fit my age. So that's when I found this place online that I went to and I had called them and I told them my situation. I told them what was going on. And they told me that they think they could help me to give them a couple days and they would get back with me since I'll be coming from down south to up north and they wanted to see if that was possible. And so they got back with me and they were like, well, why do you want to come to this one? We have plenty of them around the whole entire United States. I was like, well, I have family up north and I feel like that would be best for me to go since I don't have no family. So two weeks went past and I finally got my bus ticket to go up there. So I arrived up there and that's when one of the people from the organization had came and got me. And when she came and got me, it was kind of strange. Like something was off because she came through the lobby and she was she was looking for me as if she wasn't looking for me at the same time. So she had her logo on her shirt that was the organization and she zipped up her sweater and she walked in, looked around in the bathroom. I'm like the only one standing at the desk. So how could you not recognize me? Or did y'all really go on my social media to see who I look like? I know y'all did that. So when she came up to me, she was like, Juanita, well, I was like, yes, ma'am. I'm just watching her walk around. And she was like, well, it's nice to meet you. I said, it's nice to meet you too. So we head back in the car and we went to the organization. Organization. We walked inside and I noticed that it was small and I noticed that it wasn't much youth that they said that they were going to be online. The way they had it advertised online, you would think it's like 40 youth and you would think um, it was more staff. So once I got there and arrived in that place, it was so small and it was only 12 youth to start off with. So um, I got um, undressed. They let me put my suitcase up. Um, they cleaned my bags just to make sure I didn't have any bugs coming along with me. And everything was going good in the beginning. Like it was nice and smooth. And I was starting to talk to different youth and I was asking them how they did like the place. And they were like, what made you come up here? Like this is New Jersey, South Carolina. Like, why did you want to come up here? I said, a new start, new environment. I wanted to do that and I needed that. The organization was there to help us get back on our feet, kind of, get a job so you get a job I mean you're gonna look for an apartment but so called they have apartment living and if you do so good you can transition over to the apartment living before you move out so they were gonna take you from their place to another apartment living of their place down the road and then you can move out so I felt like what I was gonna do this was my plan my plan was to work stack my money go from stack my money to looking for apartments on my own because I'm grown I had my apartment before I know the process I know what to do but they're making them feel like it's so hard to find an apartment but it's not that hard to find an apartment if you got the income you can get an apartment so I, that's how i already knew but they said that they help you stack your money they'll allow you to stay there and they'll take care of you and they'll make sure that you're getting everything done your responsibilities and look after you but it was just false hope like you would think that you would do that you would think you have all this money saved up but you don't so i started this job working at aeropostle and when i went back to the organization to let them know what kind of job i got and they told me the percentage they were going to take out was 90 percent so they can save the amount of money for me to get out of there so once i got out i would have had enough money saved up so one of my friends that was in the shelter she did given 90% of her paycheck and on Tuesdays because she got paid on that Tuesday so what she would do was go cash her check bring the receipt back of how much your check was and she would go back to the desk where they'll tell you how much you're going to give them and then you pocket the rest whoever is the CEO of this place know what they're doing and there's 31 of them so for all these kids who are working they're taking a certain percentage they're not seeing their money because you can see in the reviews people are saying that we used to stay there that they did not receive their money after they left i feel like they're basically controlling us because all these children who are working in these different states at this organization they're taking 90 percent of our money and we don't even have enough to save up to even get out like they take all of our money and that's when we try to go look at different places 
We don't even know how much money we have saved up. They won't even give you that information. You have to be in there at a certain time. And one night I got there at 9.16 and uh, the staff member said, where you been at? And I already knew that they were gonna try to like make it seem like a situation bigger than it wasn't. So I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get in trouble. Like I'm supposed to be at nine o'clock and it's 9.16. And they were already trying to find ways to kick me out. So when I got there, it was 9.16 and the staff member, he was like, um, where you been at? I said, I wasn't paying attention to the time. It was like, okay. He was like, well, you know, sex trafficking is bad. I said, okay, like what do you, like in my head, I'm like, what do this got to do with us talking right now? He was like, this is not like down south. Sex trafficking is bad. I was like, okay. Like as I'm trying to walk in my room, he's standing at the other door and it was like, sex trafficking is bad. When I tell you, his eyes were like pretty brown. His eyes had turned pitch black and it shook me. Like when I tell you, I, I started to walk really fast towards my um, roommate room. And I told her, I was like, girl, I said, Mr. Chad said that sex trafficking is bad. She was like, yeah, I know. I was like, but he said it really evil. She was like, that's strange. So that's when we started to talk about all the staff members. And that's when God told me to take out my phone and record. So I had recorded that same night from from when me and my roommate was talking about everything, the living condition, down to them trying to hold us in front of the building, trying to get us on this truck to get an HIV test. Like the lady literally barged in front of the door and trying to make us get on that truck, which I felt like they had HIV on the needles because y'all shouldn't make us wanting to get these tests done. That should be something that we want to do. And they told us that we were going to get a gift card with $20 on it. But then when we got the gift card, well, I didn't do it. I didn't do the test, but the other kids did. But when they received the gift cards, it was only $5 on it. How you go from 20 to five. I felt like that was a setup. So then that's when I went to the police station. But before I went to the police station, I went to the hospital. I went to GameStop. I went to all these public places trying to get help because I knew something wasn't right. And for him to bring up sex trafficking out of nowhere, it kind of shook me and it scared me really bad. So um, a couple places I went to, they were telling me that I'm not the right age to be in there. I'm not even supposed to be in there. I said, how? They were like, they don't take 21 year olds. I was like, what ages do they take? 18 and under. So I'm like, what am I doing here? I said, well, I'm here. And I was like, that's crazy. And um, I started to talk to this other guy and they were telling me all different kind of crazy things. And that's when I felt like I had enough of proof to go to the police station. And that's when once I was gonna go to the police station, you cannot go back to the place because they told us once you go to the police, you are not allowed to go back in. So basically you're not allowed to call 911 or none of that. So I went to the police and I showed them all my proof and told them what was going on. And the officer acted like he could help me. He was like, um, there always been something wrong with that place. And I tried to help this one boy out and I never seen him again. I was like, okay, like, where did he go? He said he just vanished. And so he told me to write everything down on the paper. I said I did not want to write anything down on the paper. I wanted to be able to talk to someone. And he told me that I would be able to talk to a, a detective. And I was like, all right, that's fine. And so I continued to write down my letter and I told him what was going to happen after I had wrote it. And I said, they're not gonna let me back inside. And that's when I went to a booth and these people were giving me a run and I was never able to talk to no one basically. But I went to this booth and I had sat down before I had talked to this officer, this lady had came up to me and she was like, where are the people at? I said, I don't know. She was like, well, I'm just trying to let you know that they're just helping the kids with the social security numbers and not doing anything to hurt them. I was like, huh, like where is this coming from? Here I am trying to report this organization and you're telling me something that's kind of related. How do you know this? Because I felt like I was going to be followed up there. So I lifted up my clipboard and I grabbed it and brought it to my chest. And that's when she was like, well, um, I was just trying to help you out. I was like, no, you can't help me. I said, can you just leave me alone? Because I started to get aggravated. And that's when she looked at me like really mad. And she had my, you no, know, she had a she in bag. And she slammed it down on this police station desk. And she walked out of there. And I was like, hold up, that bag looks familiar. So I got up out of the little booth and I walked over there to the table. And I noticed that was my bag with someone else's clothes in there that they had killed. They basically tried to set me up with a murder scene. I would have touched those clothes. I could have been trapped in that city. They did not want me to get back home, basically. Oh my goodness. So like I backed up from that bag and I did not touch it. And my heart started to race. And that's when I went back to the booth, pick up the phone. And that's when they told me someone was going to come out there. So this tall Hispanic officer came out there and he told me that he never heard of the place that I was in. The place was never been in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I'm like, so if this is not the place, where am I? He said he'd never heard of it. He didn't even know they had one. Now, come on, y'all live literally about five blocks away from this place. 
Like this off, I mean, the police station is five blocks away from the place that I was at, the organization. How do y'all not know that this place is here? The big logo on the door, on the building. So then that's when I was like, okay, that's fine, whatever. So he was like, what do you want to do? I said, well, I can't go back there since I came to you guys. He was like, well, we can escort you there to get your stuff stuff, and we can take you to another shelter. I said, okay, that's fine. So then that's when I went back to the place, to the organization, and I had got my bags. And what I noticed was very strange. I was trying to tell the officers in the car and they could not go in there. And they were talking with each other instead of me, ignoring me. So when we arrived to the place, the officer opened the door like it was nothing. I'm like, oh, well, I think they get a piece of the pie too because you're just going in here like it's nothing. And as soon as I go in there, one of the staff guys said, we're not holding her hostage. Like she could leave. That's the first thing they said to the officers and the officers, they kind of brushed it off what he said. And that's when they told me that I could go upstairs and get my bags. I was like, uh, no, thank you. I'm not going up there to get my stuff until you can bring it down here to me. So then that's when they went up there, got my bag, put everything inside um, a trash bag. And as they bought the trash bag down, I got it. And then that's when I looked through the trash bag to make sure anything, nothing was in there with my like DNA leaving behind. And then as I was looking through the bag, I noticed the same bag that they had at the police station it was not in there and I was like thank god I didn't touch it so I left everything that I didn't need behind and I grabbed my things got back in the police car and they took me to this other shelter and the shelter that they took me to it was kind of strange because I felt like that was a real shelter besides the one I was at. The one that I was at, it was kind of off with all the things that were going on. But the one that they took me to, it was like, wow, this is like a real legit shelter. But at the time, I was thinking the organization was fake. But come to find out, it's not. It's a nationwide thing. So um, I arrived at that shelter and that's when I was like, I'm not going to stay here. I unpacked some of my stuff to make things lighter and I started to walk up out of there. I stopped at this local convenience store to get an energy drink and that's when I walked out of there and one of the guys with a glass glasses on, he had curly hair and he was like, um, I'll walk you back. And he was an older guy. I said, no, like, how did you get up here this fast? I didn't even notice you. So it was like everything was plotted and set up. That's how I felt at the time. And that's when I said, no, thank you. So I walked out of there and I was lost in the streets for two hours, trying to find my way back to the Hard Rock Casino where I felt more comfortable at. And once I got inside the Hard Rock Casino, I was being followed through there. When I sat, when I sat at the casino slot, it was one by one by one different people that like they were like, you know, sleeping on the streets, came inside, walked past me and looked at me boldly like if they could they would grab me and strangle me and put me in a hole somewhere that's how the faces they were giving me and I was so scared I got in Wi-Fi I kept calling my mom back and forth back and forth and she was like there's nothing I can do Juanita all I can do is just pray and I'm like mom this is really scaring me I said I just want to go home I just want to come home she said well you can come home first thing in the morning I was like okay so I went to the bathroom to get like a little nap before I had left that um, Hard Rock Casino and leave for the day. So after I had my nap, I left out of the Hard Rock Casino and I started to walk around the streets. And as I was walking on the streets, I was noting so, noticing so many young youths screaming a holler like they lost their mind, like they were in another place. And in my heart, I felt like they were once at that organization and something happened to them and they lost their mind because I was on the verge of losing my mind as well because I could feel it. My mind wasn't like the way it was when I. I had arrived there. So that day, my, me and my roommate had met up because they finally let her out and they were trying to keep her in there so that she couldn't meet up with me. So when she finally did meet up with me, I told her how I went to the police station because we couldn't communicate because my phone was off. So I told her about the police station, told her about all that happened. And she was like, bro, you really went there? I was like, yes. And she was like, ain't no way. I was like, yes, I felt like I had enough evidence to go there. So then that's when we started to talk about everything. And I went to the bus station to get my um, bus ticket. My mom was trying to send me money and I was going to try to get me a bus ticket so I was trying to go there to see how much the bus ticket was and that's when I noticed one of the staff members were behind the desk how did this staff member get behind the desk the same exact time I'm trying to get a ticket to Muddle Beach back home like how I didn't even know y'all had real jobs how did you get behind this desk so in that moment right then and there she was like oh you don't have to give me your information if you don't want to I looked at her and I didn't say nothing to her she told me I could go to the kiosk but I didn't go to the kiosk went to the officer transit guy and I was trying to tell him what was going on I was whispering it to him who was behind the desk what was going on my situation and when I said that man screamed at me from the top of his long the whole place echoed everybody looked over there and he was like what is wrong with these people today they're not gonna bother you just get on the bus and go home I was like okay you know what I'm not gonna let this get to me because you don't know me so I walked away 
and he looked at his friend very weird and I just felt like I was nothing when that happened. So then I went back to my roommate and we went to Dunkin Donuts to grab some Wi-Fi and something to drink and that's when one of the staff members pulled up her car in front of Dunkin Donuts. She had a baby in the back seat and she was trying to play off as if she was sitting there. They didn't say nothing to us, they just sat there. So once we left Dunkin's because we noticed her, we went back to the bus station. Then we noticed another staff member walking past us and when I say it was different people, not just the staff members, it was different people who were looking at us boldly and we both noticed this and we were like freaking out. I said, girl, I just want to get back home. That's all I want. And so I was there out there that night to about seven o'clock and that's when I reached out to one of my family members and they had came and got me. And I went to my family member house until I was able to get back home. Ever since I left that place, I felt very paranoid because they were following me every single where I went. I even came back home, like, fearing for my family, telling my family they can't go outside, they can't do this and that and the third, because that's how shook up them people had me. After going through everything I went through that same day trying to get home, and they froze my cash app, my bank's account, I couldn't receive money from my mom, so then that's when... I came back home after all that happened and they still followed me. I thought it was going to be over, but they still followed me and that's when I took it to my police station. So I went to my local police station and when I went in there, I asked him, I said, are you a real officer? Because after everything I went through, I just want to make sure. And he was like, yeah, of course I am. So he took me to the back, which and I felt like when I was at the other police station, they should have did the same exact thing, the proper stuff that my local police station did. That's how I knew everybody's getting a piece of the pie. So when I went inside my police station, he said, what's your name? What's your situation? Why are you here? So I told him, I said, sir, I said, I feel like I have a story that can break all nations on I said, you know what? This came from God. I said this in my head. I said, you know what? This came from God. I have a story that will break all nations. And he said, what is it? And I told him the name of the organization. I told him what was going on. I emailed him my proof, emailed him my pictures, every single thing so that he could get a take a look at it. And he looked at everything and he was like, like in a wow, a shock. And I'm like, okay, like, why is your face like this? That's what I was saying inside my head. And all of a sudden he looked like he wanted to cry for me. And I still couldn't get it. So then that's when he said, give me one day and I'll get back with you. So I gave him that one day and that's when he emailed me. And he said, human trafficking hotline, please contact this number. We couldn't do anything because it's out of our jurisdiction. And just because I just wanted to make sure that was him that emailed me because my phone was tapped. And every single time I was sending out emails, they wouldn't go to the people. They would go somewhere else. So I rode back up to the police station to see if that was him that emailed me. And that's when all of a sudden he was like, yeah, that was me that emailed you. He said, just contact that number right here. I said, so this is what, what I was in. He was like, yes, ma'am. And I contacted them and I told them everything. And they told me I was also in a human trafficking situation as well. Human trafficking is modern day slavery. So one of the um, things I went through while I was there, I wanted some water one night and they told me that I have to have points to get water. I said, okay, cool, what do I have to do? And it was like, well, go ahead and do your regular chore, which was the vacuum downstairs. I said, all right, I'm gonna do that. And they told me that I would get points if I vacuumed the whole entire girls floor upstairs. upstairs. And I said, okay, cool, I'll do that. So then I vacuumed the whole entire lobby downstairs and then I went upstairs and back in the whole entire girls floor upstairs. And that's when I went to Mr. Chad to tell him I finished everything. And he gave me a paper with 300 points on it. I said, okay, well, here you go. I'm gonna get some water now. He said, the water is 500 points. I was like, for a water bottle, 500 points? And you were not gonna give me a water? He was like, nope, you don't got the points. I said, okay, all right. So I went to the water fountain to drink out of that nasty water they had. Um, I do feel like when I first came back home, like it messed with me a lot. I couldn't sleep for a while. I had to relearn how to drive because I lost memory once I came back home. I lost a lot of memory. It was like I had to relearn a couple things. Even my age, like it was the small things I had to think about and remember. And um, I was so like very, I felt my confidence in myself was very low because when I came back home, I had looked like a stick. But before I left, like I was fine. And um, they followed me down here. That was another thing that really bothered me. And I was fearing for my family. And my mom was like, we're not going to live in fear. That's not what God called us to do. We're not going to live in fear. And when she said that, it kind of changed my mindset and it, kinda, it stuck with me and it helped me get through this. So with all that that happened to me, I feel like that was a wake up call. Like 
because everything happens for a reason and I want to know the reason why all that happened to me after going through so much before going up there um I felt like God had put in me he wanted me to know that he only wanted me to fear him he didn't want me to fear nobody else but him because I also ran from South Carolina as well because I didn't want to be in South Carolina to move back in with my parents from the neighborhood I ran from I didn't feel comfortable out there no more and I also didn't want to walk that shame and walk when I went back to stay with them. So he wanted me to know not to fear nobody else but him. So I felt like he took me through that for me to realize that because I was still going to fear people. And I didn't allow nobody to know I was fearing them. It was just something I kept between me and God and only him knew that. So he had to bring me through that situation so that I can only fear him and nobody else. So if I could give you guys advice i really advise you to pay attention and watch the news because you do not know what's going on around this world and i also recommend that you check out reviews before you go anywhere because um being a human trafficking survivor it could be anybody a human trafficking person could be living with their person that was trafficking them and with them not even knowing so it's very important to know your research on every single thing that's going on 24 7 around this world